Hello students, welcome to La Excellence. Welcome to the session on India Yearbook 2017. As you are aware, every year there will be at least some 5 to 6 questions only from India Yearbook. We can show you exactly from which lines some questions had actually come. This year if you observe, there is huge changes that are being made in the book itself. Earlier, we used to see lot of information from 1947 till now. But now, majority of the information which are junk are removed from the book and only those informations that are actually required from the current year perspective is being given. Every ministry gave a detailed report of what are all the achievements of those ministries in PIB. Most of the information which was in PIB is also available in your India yearbook. If you actually observe the trend of UPSC, one year there will be more questions from economic survey and the other year there will be more questions from India yearbook. If you look at the changes that actually happened, the year 2014-15 when economic survey came in two volumes and there were major changes, several questions came from economic survey. This year, if you observe, majority of the questions will come from India yearbook because there is huge changes that are being made in the book itself. Lot of unwanted content is being eliminated and only those which are required are present in those chapters which are traditional and in those chapters which keeps changing based on the ministries, we usually observe that only the programs which are functional are being given. Because of this, it's very, very important for us to read India yearbook carefully this year. If you see, every chapter is based on a particular topic or particular department after third or fourth chapter, where they talk about what were the merits, demerits, what have been the achievements of a particular ministry, in the last three years. So, high possibility that you can get good number of questions from this. But before we begin with, I just want to tell you, I want to give you the content or I want to show you the lines which are actually important in the India yearbook directly from the book itself. I don't want to rely on any summaries and I would suggest you please don't look at any summaries. The reason for this is, usually whenever questions are picked from either India yearbook or economic survey, usually it is those lines which are being picked. I am repeating, I told this in economic survey lecture also, I am telling you in the India yearbook session as well. That is, they will actually take lines directly from the book itself. When they are taking the lines directly from the book, some modifications will be made from those lines. So whenever you are reading, you have to read those lines again and again in the same format that exists so that if they change any line, you will be in a position to understand that and you will be in a position to answer those questions better. So my request to you is, please ensure that you have a hard copy of India yearbook. I will be telling you the page numbers and the paragraphs and the lines which are important from both prelims and mains. There are some issues which can be used from mains point of view or from essay point of view or you can also use it in the interview. Those things also I will tell you, you just need to mark and I will divide it into three. One area which is only important for prelims, other area only important from mains. There will be some other topics which will be important from both prelims and mains. So we need to combine all these and ensure that we are going to look at those questions which are important, not only from prelims or mains, but also from interview point of view. And sometimes I will also tell you those lines to read once. It is not important, but rarely, sometimes UPSC may ask you a question about those topics. Even those topics we will be seeing from the book. Right guys? So, please ensure that you watch this thoroughly till the end, so that 
you get each and every topic and line which is important. Then the second important thing is whenever I show you any line, I will try to tell you if there is anything related to that that you need to read. For example, when we are actually looking at the first chapter, we will be showing you some major river basins in India. So my request to you is you have to open atlas and you have to mark these major Indian rivers or after finishing the lecture you have to read them specifically. Sometimes if something is related to polity, I will ask you to read some additional information from your Lakshmi Kant. If something is related to economy and if something had come in economic survey and if we have already seen it, I will tell you from where to see. So interlinking with different subjects is also very very important when we are actually reading India your book. Right? So if you can understand these things, it will be very easy for us to look at this. And the last point before I begin with the session is that we will be releasing videos in parts and the first part will be available for everyone on YouTube. First five chapters will be covered in this particular part. So please go through this and after this the link will be provided in the comment section or at the end of the video just to ensure that you can go there and see the remaining videos. Right? So this information I am giving you in the beginning itself. So please don't think that we are covering only five six chapters and we are not covering the remaining portions. Right guys, so let's begin with India your book 2017. So guys, if we actually look at the first chapter, the first page, some geography based information is available. I'll show you some factual information which is important from your NCRT's point of view as well. Even though you would have read, it would be helpful if you can revise those points. And I'll show you some points which are not there in your NCRT books, which will be very, very important from the India yearbook itself. If you see, the third paragraph actually talks about where exactly Indian latitudes lie. So this 8 degree 4 minutes and 37 degree 6 minutes north, and 68 degree 7 minutes and 97 degree 25 minutes east. So this north south they made a mistake and they had actually asked a question already. So please be careful. And you also need to know about this 3214 and 2933 kilometers that is from north south and east west what is the difference. And most importantly you also have to know about the land frontier and the maritime boundary. The reason for this is whenever you are talking about the maritime boundary 6900 kilometers without Andaman and Nicobar or Lakshadweep and when we are talking about the land border it is 15,200 kilometers. Because of this vastness it is very difficult for us to actually guard this border carefully. And if you are aware Bangladesh has the highest or longest border with India. So this information is required and the most important thing when we talk about the geographical background is countries which have common border with India. Afghanistan also has border with India. When you actually look at the atlas, the POK part of Jammu and Kashmir actually has border with Afghanistan. Even though India Indian administered Kashmir do not have direct border with Afghanistan, we say Afghanistan is our neighbor. The reason for this is simple, that is we have a claim over the territory and Pakistan has illegally occupied that particular territory because of which we say that Afghanistan is a border. So don't get confused, don't think that Indian administered Kashmir don't have border with Afghanistan and because of this can I write Afghanistan is a neighboring country or not as India yearbook talks about certain facts and whenever there are any factual doubts about India and if India yearbook says that it stands with a particular argument and that argument will be important for you. So Afghanistan also shares border with India. Then in the hard copy, page number 2, first line actually talks about the high altitudes allow travel only through a few passes, notably the Jalipla and Natula, on the main Indo-Tibet trade route through a Chumbi valley 
north east of Darjeeling and Shipkila in the Satlaj Valley, north east of Kalpa or Kinnor. So, this can be asked. Please try to remember this year when we actually look at these laws or passes which are actually there along the McMohan line between India and China, we usually observe it is important one at the Chumbi Valley, Sikkim, because the Bhutan area where there is actual problem between China and Bhutan is closer to the Chumbi Valley. So they may ask you a question where there is discussion happening between China and Bhutan about the land boundary agreement and China has claimed or is asking Bhutan to give the territory closer to the Chumbi Valley. And if Bhutan gives this territory to China, then for Chinese it will be easy to access our Siliguri corridor or chicken neck, which is very very crucial for us to reach to northeast. So because of this, this Chumbi Valley is important. And the second important thing that we need to observe is, we need to look at different laws or passes because India is also trying to have this border roads organization constructing roads closer to this and we are trying to increase the number of armed forces which will be stationed near these borders or near these passes. And the third important thing, China wants to reach to Nepal and Bhutan. But Bhutan has not accepted with the Chinese argument, but Nepal is ready for the Chinese investments. So please try to see if there are mountains between Nepal and China, what are the valleys which are actually important for Chinese to enter into Nepal. So these are some of the factual informations which we will be seeing in our current affairs sessions as well. But I am trying to tell you that in the Atlas book, the geography through maps this year, I will be focusing on all these issues. But at last when you are actually reading, it is very very important for you to identify these areas. Please mark it as geography through maps, there you can write passes between India, China, Nepal and China. Right? Do not just focus on CPEC, even Nepal-China relations is very very important. Then the next important issue is actually with respect to desert. When we read any of the NCRT books, everything talks about desert as one of the climatic feature which is present in India. But unfortunately, no one actually talks about the differences which is there within the desert itself. There is something called as great desert and little desert. You can see in the third paragraph of second page where they talk about differences between great desert and little desert. So what exactly is the difference? UPSC may ask you a question. Consider the following statements with respect to great desert and little desert. So the great desert extends from the edge of runoff Kutch beyond the Luni river northward and the whole of Rajasthan and Sindh frontier runs through this. The little desert extends from the Luni between Jaisalmar and Jodhpur up to the northwest. Between the great and little deserts lies a zone of absolutely sterile country consisting of rocky land cut up by limestone ridges. Here we usually get lot of limestone and cement industries are also present. It is very very important for us to remember this factual information. Again I am repeating this is not present in any of the NCRT books from geography point of view this information is very crucial for you. And then in the second page itself. In fourth paragraph, last line when you observe, we know that the southernmost point or the southern point of the plateau is formed by Nilgiri hills where the eastern and the western Ghats meet. Everyone is aware of this. But what is more important is, if we see there are some mountain ranges beyond this Nilgiris as well. They are actually not continuation of Eastern Ghats, but they are continuation of Western Ghats. So UPSC may give you these two statements and in the second statement, they may actually change this Western Ghats to Eastern Ghats. Do not be confused, whatever is beyond Nilgiri is actually your Western Ghats. Right? So please be careful about this factual information. Next, if you see the last two lines, they actually talk about Debang and Lohit river which joins the Brahmaputra and the combined river flows all along the Assam valley. This question was asked, that is Debang and Lohit is actually present in which state? 
so please be careful and it is a tributary of what it is tributary of brahmaputra right this is very very important for you then in the third page last line and fourth page first line there is some information with respect to brahmaputra and barak river so if we see the principal tributaries of brahmaputra in india are subansiri jia bareli dansiri putimari Pagladia and the Manas. They may ask you which of the following are the tributaries of Brahmaputra. Recently you might have heard of Namami Brahmaputra as well. So please be careful about this. We usually focus on tributaries of Ganga. We usually focus on tributary of Indus. But this year tributary of Brahmaputra is also important. This year as I told you I won't be doing videos only for geography through maps of the world but I'll be doing for India as well. So please be careful you are going through these to understand what are the areas that we need to focus this year based on the current affairs. And the second important thing that we need to see is the Barak river. You know that Tista is a tributary of Brahmaputra. And the other important thing is about the Barak River. The reason why we need to read Barak River importantly this year is because Barak River is considered to be one of the national waterway. They are trying to make Barak River to be a waterway. So because of this it is important. Last time they asked a question about Barak River when India wanted to construct a dam on Barak River. But this year as they are planning to make it a national waterway, it's very very important for us. So when we are looking at this, the Barak River, the head stream of Meghana rises in the hills of Manipur. So they may ask you, last time they asked a question, Barak River is a tributary of which river? So it is Meghana. Now they may ask you where does it rise? It is Manipur. Then there can be question about the tributaries of Barak River as well. None of your NCRT books actually explains you about the Barak River. So it's very important for us to read about Barak River here. So that is Makku, Trang, Tuvai, Jiri, Sonai, Rukni, Kathakal, Daleshwari, Maduva and Jatinga. So by the time I am reading, if you can't find it, you can identify and mark it. That's the reason I am spending some time wherever questions are going to come. Even though we will be slow initially to understand what is important, it is very, very important for us to remember those points then and there and also know that this question is important from prelims. Please mark it as P so that it will be important. This entire chapter is important from prelims so that before prelims, you are going to go through this chapter again. Then in fourth page fifth paragraph if you observe they actually talk about the rivers which do not drain into sea that is Luni, Machu, Rupin, Saraswati, Banas, Gagga they may ask you which of the following rivers do not drain into sea right so please be careful this can be asked in the exam and please try to remember and see which are not part of it as well in the next paragraph you actually have 12 major river basins in India. In India, the river basins can be divided into major and minor on the basis of the catchment area. That is, if the catchment area is beyond 20,000 square kilometer, then it is important for us to call it as major river basins. So, which are these? They are, everyone will be knowing, Ganga, Brahmaputra, Meghana, they have combined. So, don't say they are three different river basins. So, they all come to be only one. So, you have two major river basins, Godavari, Krishna, Kaveri, Mahanadi, everyone knows. But other major basins which we won't be knowing is Pennar, Brahmani, Baitarni in Odisha, Sabarmati, Mahi, Narmada and Tapti we know. So these four, Pennar, Brahmani, Baitarni, Sabarmati and Mahi. UPSC, if it asks you, which of the following is considered to be major river basins? And if they give 1, 2, 3, 4, they usually try to add Pennar, Brahmani, Baitarni, Sabarmati and Mahi. So this becomes difficult for you. So please be careful, you are not going to leave these rivers. Usually major rivers, we all know Ganga, Brahmaputra and all, but we won't be knowing these to be part of major river basins. So that is important. The second important thing is, please try to see in the next paragraph, some rivers which are important. Eight river basins are given here. So these eight river basins with the help of atlas C ones. Not so important, but just try to read once. Right guys? So 
here these points are important for you from prelims point of view again. Then in page number 5, second paragraph, they have actually given information about the six seasons which are there in India and their Sanskrit names as well. It's very important for you to remember. Please see, whenever in India yearbook any information is given, this book is not written for UPSC aspirants, but it is actually written for the world about India. So it becomes important. They may ask you match the following about this. So just try to remember once. Then in the same page, under flora, you actually have India can be divided into eight distinct floristic regions, namely the Western Himalayas, the Eastern Himalayas, Assam, the Indus Plain, Ganga Plain, Deccan, the Malabar and the Andamans. This can be a question. Which of the following are part of India's floristic regions? Right? So please be careful. They have actually picked these type of lines and asked you questions. Environment and ecology, this is very, very important. Then the next paragraph completely try to read once. The reason for this is, whatever we have seen there, some important species are given here. Every line of this is important. Any line can be picked and they may make a question out of this. So this paragraph is very, very important from prelims point of view. I'm not going to read anything because it is factual information and it is available in your NCRT books, but not properly. The language, if it comes in the exam, it will be from this. So please be very, very careful about this particular paragraph, especially from environment and ecology point of view. Then in page number six, when you look at the faunal resources, the first paragraph itself, you have according to the world biogeographic classification, India represents two of the major realms. What is it? It is Palearctic and Indo-Malian. So they will ask you, according to the world biogeographic classification, India represents which of the following? Realms. So it is Palearctic and Indo Malian. They can change the question and ask you according to world biogeographic classification, India falls under which of the following biomes? Then it is tropical humid forest, tropical dry or deciduous forest, and warm deserts or semi deserts. They may again change the question and they may ask you according to the Wildlife Institute of India has proposed a modified classifications which divides the country into 10 biogeographic regions. Can you see here? World biogeographic classification, two realms and three biomes. But according to Wildlife Institution of India, it is 10. So which are these? Trans-Himalayan, Himalayan, Indian Desert, Semi-Arid, Western Ghats, Deccan Peninsula, Gangetic Plain, Northeast India, Islands and Coast very very important from UPSC point of view they may change the language guys here it's not important for you to remember what exactly the names are because you will be knowing by this time you would have read the geography but what is important is the language because here they may ask you in two different ways if they ask you biomes it is different if you if they ask you realms it's different but both these are with respect to world biogeographic classification but when it comes to Indian Wildlife Institute, then the way the classification goes on is different. So this is very, very important for us to understand, right? So please be careful about this particular wordings so that if they ask you, it would be very easy for you to pick and write them. Then in page number seven, we actually see the demographic background that is the census information. In this first important thing is census 2011 was the 15th census of its kind since 1872. There are some factual errors. There are some factual information which is correct here. So we need to see which one is very, very important for us. Density of population is important. Density in 2001 was 325 and now it is 382. Difference being 17.5%. So this can be asked. Then they may also ask you with respect to the gender composition, how it has increased. And then it is very important for us to look at the literacy. What exactly do we mean by literates? Earlier, when they talked about literates, the definition was different. For this census, literates constitute 
aged 7 and above usually whatever government program you see it will be 6 but especially literacy is 7 and above the reason for this is 0 to 6 6 to 14 is the minimum RT that has been given so one year of education is at least important so it is 7 and above right and earlier those who were below this to be considered as illiterates but now they are not considering them as illiterates they are not considering this population at all because of this what happens the literacy level see guys for example if you take the number of literates by number of illiterates then the ratio decreases now in the illiteracy I will remove certain population then obviously the ratio improves this was one criticism of the government that you are trying to modify the definitions just to ensure that you have more number of literates in the country but to be frank when we actually look at the effective literacy rate this is how it should be calculated right and I'll also give you who exactly is called as a literate from the book itself that is whether you have to read or whether you should know both reading and writing. So let's see what exactly is the definition of literacy. So when we look at the literacy, for the purpose of census 2011, a person aged 7 and above who can both read and write with understanding in any language is treated as literate. Right? So who can both read and write it is not only reading or writing. So it is both reading and writing. A person who can only read but cannot write is not literate. This is very, very important, right? Then we have to see Kerala retained its first position followed by Lakshadweep. It is actually important when we actually look at the literacy rate. But the second is Lakshadweep. So please be careful. Bihar is last. Kerala tops both male and female. And Bihar is lowest in both the terms of males and females. So again, this information is very, very important for us, right? When it comes to literacy, which state is first and which state is last, which union territory is first? This is also important for you. Many of us will feel it may be Delhi. So it's not Delhi, it's Lakshadweep. So it's very, very important for you to remember these two facts. So then let's quickly move to the next chapter that is national symbols. This year it is very very important because you know there is huge debate between the nationalists and anti-nationalists. They may actually ask you question from national flag or national emblem. So let's see what exactly can be the question. So the first thing is the national flag shall be rectangular in shape and the ratio of the length to the height of the flag. So don't get confused with these two UPSC may actually interchange it. So they may say height to the length. So you may feel yes, it's right. So please be careful. It is length to the height is 3 is to 2. Very, very important. Please be careful about this. Then the design was actually adopted by the Constituent Assembly on July 22nd, 1947. Even this can be asked. So guys, these two are very, very important for you. Remember these two. Next, let's see state emblem. So when we are looking at the state emblem, we need to see that how many animals are actually present on it. You have four lions, elephant, galloping horse, a bull and a lion also present just below the emblem. So this information is also important. But whatever we have adopted in that, we can see three lions and a bull on the right and a galloping horse on the left. So even this information is very, very important for us. So just look at these two. And then it was actually adopted as state emblem of India on 26 January 1950. Even this information is important. They may ask you arrange the following in increasing order of their dates adoption. So they may ask you with respect to national flag, constitution, state emblem and national song. So all these are important. So please be very careful, right? And Satya Meva Jayate was from Mundaka Upanishad, which was also asked in exam before. So this information from state emblem is required. So in next page 28, we actually look at the national song, which was adopted in Hindi version on Jan 24th, 1950, right? This information is important. And when was it first sung? 1911 at the Calcutta session of the Indian National Congress and there are two factual informations here that is it takes approximately 52 seconds to sing and if you actually see the playing time it's approximately 20 seconds in certain occasions it will be played so 52 seconds is also important then we actually look at 
national song here you have bankim chandra chatterjee right and then it was actually sung in 1896 session of the indian national congress and national song was translated into english by arbindo even this is important nowhere you will get this information so please be careful about it then comes our national calendar from where question was already asked next let's see national calendar there was a question already about national calendar but let's see some of the other important facts as well one the national calendar is based on which era this can be a question which is the first month chaitra so the question which was asked in upsc was which day is considered to be the first chaitra that is 22nd march or 21st march on the basis of leap year this was actually asked can you see it is actually on the last page of this chapter and the last line usually most of the questions from india yearbook are from the last paragraphs whether it is mains or prelims i can show you multiple questions which are on the last paragraphs so please be very very careful about these last paragraphs whenever you read i would suggest you whenever you are doing your second revision or third revision come from back so that it will be very very easy for you right so these informations first two chapters are important later we can quickly move out because the next chapter is polity where lakshmikanth is more than enough some information which is not there even in lakshmikanth have to be observed here so what are these let's see quickly so please open page number 45 in page number 45 at last you have the ministry of home affairs which of the following departments actually come under ministry of home affairs can be asked if there is a question that is department of official language comes under ministry of home affairs or ministry of culture most of us will write that it is under ministry of culture so please be careful that it is under ministry of home affairs and department of jammu and kashmir affairs is also under home ministry lot of issues are happening in jammu and kashmir so who has to take care it's home ministry and then you have border management also comes under home ministry don't get confused border management is not with defense ministry but it is under home ministry so this information is very very important then please see page number 48 where you actually look at national authority chemical weapons convention so this year there can be a question about this we expected a question on chemical weapons convention and it came in the year when the sarin gas was actually used for the first time in syria which also led to some sanctions against syria russia came in between and helped again this year the same incident has actually happened so chemical weapon convention is very very important for us to actually implement this chemical weapons convention india has actually established the national authority so the third paragraph is very very important for us where we actually talk about the national authority is responsible for implementation of cwc act liaison with organization for the prohibition of chemical weapons and other state parties fulfilling the declaration obligation negotiations and other things right so this is very very important for us and then and then from mains point of view please see the functions of the national authority once there is a project monitoring group which tries to ensure that india is abiding by the principles of the cwc so very very important they will ask you very basic questions in prelims but in mains it comes to this that is issues pertaining to union ministries and issues pertaining to the state governments what needs to be done by the national authority guys this can be a question so please be careful whenever this chemical weapon attacks has actually happened UPSC has focused on this even in the current affairs we will be focusing on CWC specifically but my request to you national authority CWC from India ye book is also very very important right i will explain CWC in the current affairs but this is required for you from prelims and mains point of view as well so guys the next important topic is in next chapter agriculture apart from that there is nothing much to see in the polity chapter so in page number 76 major programs of the government is given so it's very very important for us to look at it the first one is pradhan mantri krishi sinchai yojana right where they are talking about an outlay for 5 years so what exactly does 
this program look for? Investments in irrigation at the field level, expand cultivable area under irrigation, improve on form water efficiency to reduce wastage of water, enhance the adoption of precision irrigation and other water saving technologies. Right? So, this can be asked. Consider the following under Pradhan Mantri Krishi Sinchai Yojana. So, please be careful. So, they may ask you about this particular fact. Then, then in page number 77, you can look at the crop insurance. Last year, there was a question about the Pradhan Mantri Fasal Bhima Yojana. Right? So, if you actually see, exactly the lines from this have been picked up. That is, under the PMFBA, a uniform maximum premium of 2% will be paid by the farmers for all Karif crops and 1.5% for all the Rabi crops. And in case of horticulture, it will be 5%. They told it will be same throughout. Why this was asked? Last year, in May, this program was actually implemented. Exam was in August. So, question came in August about a current affairs in Mainz. See guys, Prime Minister actually announced about the Fasal Bhima Yojana much before. But it came into practice only after May. So remember, question about any scheme will come not on the day of announcement of it, but once it is implemented. UPSC is much more practical when compared to other things. So whenever current affairs is there, especially government schemes comes, if you see exactly these lines are there in the department website as well. So UPSC usually picks this and tries to modify the scheme and they try to give you questions. Nowadays you can see Atal Pension Yojana or anything, some modification is done within the scheme. Earlier we used to read only the overview of it and we need to remember that Atal Pension Yojana is for whom. But now we should be careful about what are the benefits. The reason for this is much of the criticism of the present government is that it is still following the old rules or old policies in new names. Every government has this problem. But this government wants to ensure that the people are aware that there are some modifications made with respect to the previous schemes. So what exactly are this? Those modifications will be usually asked in the exam. So please be careful whenever it comes about the government schemes, you should be aware of what exactly are these with respect to the government websites itself. If it is there in the India yearbook, the same language will be there in the website because it will be copied here. So please be careful about these schemes. I'll be showing you some schemes which are very, very important this year. As Fasal Bhima Yojana was already as last year, least possibility that you may get a question. But I just wanted you to know that this is how you get a question. So next, within page 77, we actually can see Commission for Agricultural Costs and Prices, which actually looks at the MSP, right? So here, they actually talk about the pricing policy for 23 crops, which are these crops for the first time. India Yearbook is talking about all these crops. So UPSC may ask you for which of the following crops MSP is given. So that is seven cereal crops. Paddy, wheat, jowar, bajra, maize, ragi and barley. They may ask you, please remember, right? Which of the following are being given MSP? Five pulses, gram, tur, moong, urad and lentil. Definitely if they ask you, Pulses may be the most important area within that. Even though it has been given, why there is shortage? So because of this, lot of committees have been established and they have given reports. So pulses is very, very important. Seven oil seeds. Then you have copra, coon, raw jute and sugar cane, which also have this fair and remunerative prices. So guys, it is very, very important for you to remember this. Apart from this, what is important for us is to look at the determinants of MSP. How exactly is it calculated? High possibility there can be a question. I'll show you the lines which can be modified in the exam and ask the question about it. That is, when you're actually looking at the recommendations, you can actually identify that the commission keeps in mind demand and supply, cost of production, price trends in the market, both domestic and international, intercrop price parity, Terms of trade between agricultural and non-agricultural sectors, likely implications of MSP and consumers of that product, besides ensuring optimal utilization of natural resources like land and water. 
this can be one they may ask you which of the following are considered right so they may make it one two three four and they may ask you about this see the last line recommending msps of various crops is not a cost plus pricing exercise though cost is an important determinant so they may remove the not here right please be careful recommending msps of various crops is a cost plus pricing exercise many of us will feel yes it's right but it is not there are other factors that are very very important when msp is actually being given right so guys please be careful about all these factors it may be noted that cost of production is an important factor that goes on as an input but it is not the only factor that's why it is not a cost plus alone so please be careful guys this term is very very important so questions can come on these issues minutely for the first time msp and other things are given in india yearbook i'm stressing again and again so that you will not miss it so in page 79 we also have to look at the soil and water productivity when we are looking at this from mains point of view it is very very important but from prelims point of view there are some important factors that is if we actually look we have to see the major ravines everyone is aware of the chambal ravines right but mahi ravines yamuna ravines at agra are also important then plant growth promoting rhizobacteria and arthrobacter were isolated characterized and field evaluated in vertisols of madhya pradesh so this line is important that is foliar sprays with various chemicals were evaluated to mitigate dry spells during crop growing season across diverse rain fed agro ecologies so these two lines where they are actually talking about different exercises that needs to be done to ensure the soil and water productivity so in dry spells what is actually used foliar sprays guys these statements you can observe in previous year question papers as well where related to agriculture if something new comes it will be asked so this is also very very important so in page 80 you have to look at climate change where they have actually talked about the cool farm tool model which is actually used to estimate emissions of ghgs guys this is very very important for you climate change when we are actually looking they may ask you cool form tool model is used for calculating what so it is to estimate emission of ghgs they may ask you air pollution ghgs or they may ask you with respect to water pollution or anything so please be careful they will not ask you what is cool form tool model it will be too technical but they will ask you cool form tool model is used for what so this line is also very very important from exam point of view so then there is nothing much important in that chapter let's quickly move to next chapter in page 96 culture they actually talk about the dance forms it's very important for us to read it so you would have already read it in art and culture just go through this paragraph where they talk about different dance forms if you have already read it revise it from your notes else you just see these dance forms once most of us wouldn't have read about the theater which is there in the next page right where you have to look at puppets rod puppets glove puppets and leather puppets in the shadow theater this question can come so please be careful you have to read about the theater as well and guys at last in page 111 there is about एक भारत श्रेष्ठ भारत वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट दिस इयर सरदार वल्लभ भाई पटेल इज इंपॉर्टेंट हिज इन न्यूज एंड एट द सेम टाइम इवन द बुक टॉक्स अबाउट द एक भारत श्रेष्ठ भारत इन द फर्स्ट पेज इट सेल्फ सो बिकॉज ऑफ ऑल दिस हाई पॉसिबिलिटी दे मे आस्क यू ए क्वेश्चन एंड इफ यू सी द एक भारत श्रेष्ठ भारत वन दे मे आस्क यू अबाउट द ऑब्जेक्टिव वेरी सिंपल ट्राई टू रीड वंस they may give this 1 2 3 4 5 and they may ask you which of the following is right with respect to ek bharat shreshth bharat whether it is in prelims or mains it's very very important and there would be interactions across guys any statement from this can come please be careful about ek bharat shreshth bharat this year so only half a page please try to read it carefully it's very simple so possibility of getting a question about these will be rare doing mistakes will also be rare usually if any question about this comes i would feel all the above will be there because 
if you look at the language there is no scope of doing mistake and you will be able to predict the mistake as well so guys ek bharat shreshth bharat is very very important with this we actually covered the five chapters i went slowly just to ensure that you get accustomed to the way of teaching once this is done as we move ahead there are several chapters and several junk information present which is not required from upsc point of view so i'll be focusing only from upsc point of view and i'll not be wasting your time in telling about other details if i'm reading it out slowly it is just to ensure that you people have enough time to mark it so that we can go quickly to the next topic you need not pause and listen to it again and again so guys it's very very important for us to look at these chapters carefully so guys if you have liked this and if you want to see further chapters then please follow the link that is given in the comment section there you can register and you can actually watch the remaining video and try to answer as many questions as possible if there is any other suggestions please let us know thank you thanks for watching